Hey everybody, this is Aaron Harris, host of the Football Odyssey, and today I want to talk to you about Anchor. If you haven't heard about Anchor, it's the easiest way to make a podcast. Let me explain. First of all, it's free. And there are creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone and computer. Anchor will distribute your podcast for you so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many more. And you can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. It's everything you need to make a podcast in one place. So go and download the free Anchor app or go to Anchor FM to get started. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. All right, everyone, welcome back to the Football Odyssey. This is your host, Aaron Harris. On today's show, I have the honor of speaking with the Hall of Famer and former San Diego Chargers quarterback, Dan Fouts. In this wide-ranging interview, Dan walks me through various stages of his football life from his early days working as the San Francisco 49ers ball boy to being a part of the legendary Eric Coriel offense to his transition into a successful broadcasting career and much more. I believe you all will have a great time listening to Dan reflect back on parts of his life within the game of football as I did. And if you like the interview, reach out, let me know what you think, and feel free to subscribe and share. As always, thank you all for listening. And now, enjoy listening to one of the best quarterbacks to ever play the game. Okay, Dan Fouts, thank you for joining us today on the Football Odyssey. How are you this evening? Real good, Aaron. Good to be with you. Oh, it's my pleasure. Have you been enjoying the games thus far in the NFL season? Yeah, you know, every uh, every season is its own, and uh, every start to a season is so unique. So uh, who would have thought that Carolina would be 3-0? and <laughs> I don't think anybody would. So there are surprises, uh, positive and negative, throughout the league, but that's the way it is. It'll be interesting, though, Aaron, with 17 games this year, teams can afford uh, – kind of afford to get off to a slower start because they have an extra week to make up. Yeah. And it seems uh, the biggest surprise for me is the Raiders. And I know it's only two weeks in, but I mean, for Baltimore and Baltimore obviously was missing Marcus Peters, but uh, I thought they really came out and kind of showed that they're going to try to make a push for they're, they're not going to be pushed around the AFC West. Cause that's such a competitive division. And then going to Pittsburgh and winning there. I mean, I, I think they're kind of a team that even though it is early, you kind of had to respect thus far. Yeah, you got to keep your eye on them. And you talked about that division. I mean, uh, you know, you start with Kansas City and then the next three are all competing to see what they can do to, to knock off the uh, the West champs. So, uh, you know, the Raiders got a tough game in two weeks when they got to go to L.A. to play the Chargers. Mm. That'll be interesting to see which team has the most fans in the stands because the Raiders still have a tremendous following in L.A. Yeah, well, I, I think back to the game last year, I think when Herbert won in overtime on the quarterback sneak. I mean, there were so many games that the Raiders had last year that it felt like had the pendulum swung a little bit in their direction, they might have been in the playoffs. I don't remember what their actual record was, but I'm pretty sure they were on the verge of a wild card. Yeah, you know, uh, and I think you can start to see the heat starting to rise a little bit there in Vegas. And I, I mean the seat, uh, the heat that's under John Gruden's seat right now because uh, – He's had time, and uh, now is the time to, to make a push, and he, he's got to get to the playoffs this year, I believe. Do you? Uh, how do you typically watch games? I mean, do you prefer to watch one game at a time? Do you go back and forth, or are you a red zone guy? How would you kind of summarize the way you watch games? Uh, I, I watch games with guys I know, whether they're coaches or players. or Of course, I'm going to watch the Chargers because I'm still involved with uh, them uh, in a certain way, obviously, but... Uh, and I'm a big fan of Justin Herbert. So if they're on, I prefer to watch them. Uh, but then after that, uh, there's so many exciting young players that uh, each and every week do something you've never seen before or have make a tremendous play or uh, a great tackle or something. But that's what excites me about the NFL is that every week uh, you're going to see something that uh, will keep you entertained. Yeah, certainly. Have the uh, have there been a lot of comparisons between you and Herbert? Saying is that you're both from Oregon and you both play for the Chargers? No, 
<laughs> to be honest with you, I don't think so, uh, because, uh, you know, he's he's young and strong and rich, and I'm old and weak and poor, so, uh, you know, he's he's awesome. Well, and you played for the Chargers for 15 seasons. Uh, that culminated in a Hall of Fame induction. You were a broadcaster for over 30 years with a few different networks calling both college games and calling NFL games. But your football journey, so to speak, actually begins a lot earlier when you were a ball boy for the 49ers. Is that correct? Yeah, my dad was the voice of the 49ers for about uh, 20 years in San Francisco. And uh, having grown up there, I got to, uh, you know, rub elbows with the great 49er players like John Brody and Wyatt Tittle and Hugh McElhaney and Joe Perry, and, and I could go on and down the list. So uh, I was uh, really fortunate to see and experience uh, these players uh, who are really just human beings. And, uh, you know, they have their good sides and their faults. But, uh, you know, for a young kid to be on the sidelines uh, and bumping into these great players was a lot of fun. Are there any specific memories that stand out, either just in interactions with the players or maybe certain games you attended? You know, um, I, I got yelled at by Dick Butkus one time because <laughs> I was arguing a call <laughs> from the Bears' sideline. I don't know what I was thinking, but it was definitely pass interference. And uh, uh, he heard me, and he just told me to shut the blank up. You know, so uh, <laughs> that was kind of interesting. Yeah, yeah, that's got to be pretty intimidating. I also think it's it's cool that uh, was Red Hickey the coach when you when uh, you were the ball boy. Uh, he was, and then Dick Nolan, and uh, but Red Hickey was there to really invent the shotgun, and uh, a lot of great uh, memories from uh, that era with uh, Brody and Bobby Waters and Billy Kilmer running uh, the offense. First down was Kilmer, second was Waters, and Brody came in on third down, and well, Tommy Davis came in on fourth down because it didn't always work. <laughs> That that almost seems like a little bit of a foreshadowing, even though you really, if ever, operate out of the shotgun. It kind of feels like that offensive ingenuity almost foreshadowed what you would do. Well, you know, it, it, it uh, really foreshadowed uh, what everybody's doing nowadays because everybody is in the shotgun. And uh, uh, we never used it uh, because our system was based on timing and, and uh, footwork and things like that between the quarterback and the receiver. But, uh, you know... Uh, and really, if you go back even farther in NFL history, the the shotgun formation really began as the single wing, snapping the ball to the tailback. So, uh, you know, there's very few things that are new in the in the league. Uh, it just keeps evolving, and ideas get shared, and ideas get stolen, and and uh, you know, there you have it. Yeah, that that's kind of what's the beauty of football, where nothing ever seems to be truly new. It just kind of gets refurbished in a different era. I mean, I, I, I watch a lot of games on YouTube, and I can find a lot of international games as well. And I was watching a college football game um, that took place in Japan in the 80s, and they were running out of the pistol formation. And watching yeah, right. that, I was like, my God, like, is anything really original in football? Yeah, you know, the only thing that's original are the players and the, and the positions that, that they're put in. Uh, if you think about the tight end I had, Kellen Winslow, the Hall of Famer, uh, he was really the first tight end that you would see do a lot of different things besides lining up at the end of the line of scrimmage with his hand on the ground. Sure. You know, he could be out wide, he could be in the backfield, he could motion, he could uh, shift, he could, could do a lot of things that wide receivers did, and, and Coriel took full advantage of that. Now, when did you start playing football? Uh, competitively as an 11-year-old. Were you always a quarterback? Well, that's an interesting story because I didn't want to be. Uh, I wanted to be an end. Uh, we called receivers end then. Uh, back like a in split end? Uh, well, it just end. You know, they didn't, they didn't specify split or tight back in those days. So, But my dad said, if you're going to play football, you got to be a quarterback. And I said, I can't throw, Dad. And he says, you'll learn to throw. So father knows best. Why did he insist on you playing quarterback? Well, you know, the same reason he insisted on me playing shortstop. He says that's where the action is. And, uh, you know, obviously the action at quarterback is really unique to most sports, all sports, if you will. And then, you know, as a shortstop, it seems like you're always involved in a play. And what was it? I'm always curious whenever I have a guest on, what was it about the game that kind of captured your attention and made you want to play? Because 
for some people, it's the cerebral element. Other people, it's the physicality. I mean, for you, what was it that really, what was it about the sport that captured your imagination? Well, I, you know, I really haven't thought about that as far as, you know, how I looked at the game as, as a youngster. But I, I just remember throwing a spiral one time and saying, wow, that looks nice, you know. And, oh, that felt good. And, and then all of a sudden, those spirals were going where I wanted them to go. And, and that was another thing that surprised me and made me feel good. So I, I think just the pure act of throwing a spiral and having it uh, go where you wanted it to go. And when did being around the NFL at such an early age, did that kind of give you a little motivation um, when you were playing competitively in school or in youth leagues? Uh, to, you know, to say, hey, one day I want to be like these guys and maybe not make a living from it because obviously they didn't make as much then, but to want to, you know, be able to play as an adult and kind of have the same experience that they had? Well, you know, Aaron, I, I really didn't. All I wanted to do was play the next game. And whether, you know, it was Pop Warner or freshman in high school, or I just wanted to play. And, I, I, you know, I, because of that, I wanted to compete with whoever else was playing the position. There's only one quarterback that plays and I wanted to be that guy. So my focus was always right where I was at the time. And, uh, you know, to be 12, 13 years old and say, well, I want to be in the NFL someday. I think that's ridiculous, uh, because that is, uh, more than one step. That's a thousand steps. And you got to start with one step and that's the team and the, uh, the game that you're playing right now. Did you have any boyhood idols growing up when you started playing? Well, yeah, you know, there was, uh, I always enjoyed watching the 49ers, obviously. And, um, you know, the other thing, uh, you know, you, you watch a guy like Johnny Unitas or Bart Starr uh, and how great they were. And, uh, you know, I just, I just kind of gravitated to, towards the great quarterbacks. Do you remember watching the 1958 championship game? Um, you know, I was seven years old at the time. Uh, and I, I just know about the game now. I don't think it was on, it, it might've been on television back then, but I'm not sure it was, uh, yeah. Are you talking about the giants and the, and the Colts, right? Yeah. The, you know, quote unquote okay. greatest game ever played. Yeah, I do. I do remember watching that. I think, I thought you were talking about the 49ers collapse against the Detroit lions. I think it was in the 57. Uh, but anyway, yeah, the, uh, Alan Amici, you know, that was, that was awesome. I was, Pulling for the Colts in that game, and and uh, you know it was it really was the beginning of of uh, what we see today. Yeah, it seems on multiple fronts too, because when you look at the Giants, I think they were kind of the team that kind of showed the sex appeal of pro football, because you had guys like Frank Gifford doing cigarette ads, and then you also had the um, obviously you had the television element, but with the Colts, it kind of feels like they were almost the first. I guess for lack of a better term, super team. Cause I, I'd be willing to bet that most people who weren't even Colts fans could probably go down the roster and name more than half of the players they had on there. You know, I think you're right. I mean, you think about, uh, you know, how you start with the Unitas, uh, and then you got Ray Berry and Lenny Moore and Amici and LG Dupre. Uh, you know, that's just on the offensive side and Jim Parker, obviously, uh, much Teller was a tight end. Um, you know, uh, defensively, uh, you start with Art Donovan, mm -hmm. and uh, you know he was he was bigger than life. Did you get the chance to meet any of these guys? I'm obviously you got the chance to meet Unitas that we'll get into in a minute. But did you have the chance to get to talk to any of these guys um, whenever you were inducted in the Hall of Fame or at any point throughout your career, and just kind of hear stories about what it was like playing during those times? You know, that's the great thing about the Hall of Fame is that uh, you do get to sit down and, and talk to a, a Lenny Moore or Raymond Berry. Uh, and obviously my association with Unitas was, was really awesome. So, um, you know, it's such a humbling experience to be a hall of famer, uh, to walk into a room and, and see, uh, Jim Taylor and Jim Brown sitting mm -hmm. together talking. <laughs> yeah. I remember, uh, going to a dinner once and, and, uh, I saw Bart Starr, so I went over and uh, introduced myself and said hello to him and, and told him how much I admired him. He got up out of his chair and gave me a hug, and to this day, it gives me chills to think about that moment. Wow. 
that, that almost feels like the highest honor, right? I mean, you watch him as a young boy, and then whenever you go over to him, he gives you a hug. It's like, can there be a greater compliment? Well, you know, and, and a guy that doesn't get a credit for winning five NFL titles, uh, yeah. you know, one of the all-time greats. Yeah, I mean, from what I've read about the guy, and I've seen some full games, there are not a whole lot of tape prior to that, except for the NFL Films productions, but from what his teammates would say, it's like anytime they were had like a, a fourth and one, or they had a pass on fourth down, let alone third down, he was going to be the one that, to drill it in. Yeah, and, and uh, obviously he had uh, great players around him. Uh, you know, you got Horning and Taylor in the backfield, so play action passing was a pretty good deal, and then Carol Dell and, and uh, Max McGee on the outside. So uh, at a great offensive line with Fuzzy Thurston and Forrest Gregg and Jerry Kramer. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, that was a real uh, dominant team. Yeah, certainly. And it, it almost makes you kind of wonder, too, did the, did the success of the Packers during that time kind of keep the small market interest in professional football? Because it seems like the NFL was really expanding to all those metropolitan areas. And, you know, that's a really a good point. And, and, uh, you got to give the Green Bay Packers and the, and the people of Green Bay a lot of credit for, for um, you know, keeping, you know, football, the NFL in uh, Green Bay and, you know, and continue to improve the stadium and, and make it one of the toughest venues uh, in the NFL. Yeah, absolutely. Now, when you were drafted in 1973, and obviously, you know, the NFL in 1973 is night and day compared to 2021, you know, in terms of how teams draft how rosters are built, but especially the expectations that are put on a rookie coming out of college. When, when you were drafted in the third round out of Oregon, what were the expectations uh, for you from the Chargers? Was it always to sit behind Unitas after they traded for him in the offseason and kind of learn and be his understudy? Or did they expect you to come in and compete immediately for a starting job? Well, obviously, they never told me anything. Uh, in fact, uh, Harlan Zavari was our head coach and I believe uh, he he quit halfway through the season. Uh, Bob Schnelker was our offensive coordinator. He quit four games into the season. We were a disaster. So, you know, as far as being an understudy to the United States, actually, I was third team. I was competing for the second team job with Wayne Clark, who had a couple of years on me. But um, as I said, I mean, I think we were 2-11-1 and one that season, and United States got hurt after about the fourth or fifth game and, and uh, I got plugged in there and, and uh, found a way to win a, win a half a game or two games. So it, it wasn't a pretty sight in 73. Yeah. I've seen the, uh, I, I saw the NFL highlight film that they put together from there. I think they called it like skidoo or uh, something. 73 like that. skidoo. Yep. Yeah. 73 skidoo. Yep. And uh, I also read the, there was a memoir that the, um, there was a psychiatrist that had followed you guys around for that season. Uh, doc, Dr. Mandel, do you remember him? You have gone too deep in your research, Aaron. <laughs> no, I, I've read the, I read this book a year ago, I promise you. I wrote a book review for the website. Oh, that's great. Well, I'm I'm going to have nightmares tonight, that's for sure. Well, that, that was the name of his book, The Nightmare Season. And <laughs> from what I read, man, it sounds like it was a pretty wild time to be there. Well, you know, I was uh, just a young man, and, and uh, I just kept my eyes open and my mouth shut and just kind of watch the circus go by. And uh, it, it was a circus. There's no question. And a really a bad circus. In terms of like what you learned from Unitas, what was the dynamic like between you two? And um, what were some of the valuable lessons that you learned from his, um, you know, from his wisdom or from his words of advice? Well, the, the best thing was to watch him, watch how he operated. Um, you know, he was 40 years old. He had very little left. But what he had left was better than a lot of guys, okay? Mm -hmm. um, so watching him uh, operate the huddle, uh, the hurry-up offense, the timing routes, all the things that uh, you, when you think about today's game, these are the things that Unitas really perfected way back when. Uh, but he did teach me a lot about reading defenses and uh, where to look um, – uh, as you approach the line of scrimmage, uh, who who to look at, uh, and then as you're going back to pass, uh, how to move guys with your head and your eyes, uh, and the pump fakes and and the little things to maybe just give yourself an extra couple of inches to squeeze that ball in uh, to a tight window. So 
Um, you know, some of that stuff was so valuable to me as I as I progressed in my career, uh, and I owe it a lot to Johnny Yu. Coming out of college, like what kind of offense did you predominantly play in at Oregon? Well, we threw the ball a lot. Uh, our offense coordinator was John Robinson, who went on to great fame at USC and with the Rams. Uh, and ironically, at SC and with the Rams, with the Rams he had Eric Dickerson, and at SC he had all those great running backs. So he became known as a running coach. But at Oregon, uh, we threw the ball a lot, and uh, uh, we had a lot of success doing it, and he was our coordinator. So uh, I, I really uh, – felt confident when I got to the Chargers that my background at Oregon would help me. What were like some of the the more challenging aspects of reading a defense that you kind of had to um, get used to when you went to the pros? Well, the first thing is where's the blitz coming from? Mm -hmm. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) You better know that and you better be able to sense it. And that's, that's the uh, advantage that uh, I felt we always had lining up under center is that I could, see a guy uh you know giving away the blitz uh you know his eyes are bugging out of his helmet or he's dropping at the mouth or or uh you know can't can't stop sweating uh you know he's coming after you so uh, it's his opportunity to make a play so uh and sometimes in the shotgun i don't think these quarterbacks can can sense that or feel it as as easily so uh you know as far as reading the rest of the defense uh, the biggest tell, you're always looking for a tell. You do a lot of study on film, and you find out, you know, through the scouting reports and all that, who's who's the weak link, and why is he a weak link? Uh, why does he not be? Why can't he cover this route or cover that route? And and you work that, and you work that to death. Uh, it's just part of the game, and and the, you know, the the big thing is that you know you've got to be on the same page with your receivers. They got to read the same thing. Uh, and that's why practice is is so important and film study is so important. Is there a difference between a blitz and a red dog? Well, uh, a red dog is usually all three linebackers coming. And it's interesting because a green dog, and not a lot of people know what a green dog is, but a green dog is when a linebacker is reading the running back. And if the running back stays in the block, then the linebacker will come. Now, if the if the running back releases, then the, the linebacker will go with him. So it's one of those uh, things that, you know, defensively you've got to be aware of too. Yeah, that's interesting because anytime I read an old vintage biography of or a memoir that a player wrote, you know, they mentioned, you know, zone dog, red dog, green dog. And I'm aware that it has to do with some kind of blitz, but I'm not exactly sure if it's certain types of blitz or, or what have you because sometimes the nomenclature can get kind of confusing. Yeah, and it changes from team to team, and it changes from, you know, uh, decade to decade. Uh, Red Dog, as a matter of fact, was my dad's nickname because uh, when the he would go to the 49er practices, and he he was able Red Hickey and him were friends, and Red let him sit sit in on uh, meetings, and uh, so my dad kept hearing Red Hickey talking about, well, this team likes the Red Dog. And uh, that means that they're blitzing. They're coming after the quarterback. So uh, my dad's calling the play at the game, and uh, he sees the blitz coming. And it wasn't called the blitz back then. He would just say, the red dog is on. And uh, then that kind of just stuck with Bob Tubbs. Well, that was easy for you to remember when you were reviewing the playbook then. (laughs) That's for sure. When when you came into the league, was film study a uh, real big practice at that point, or was that something that as you went deeper into the pros, it started taking on more steam? Well, it literally was film, okay. And, and uh, I would take home cans of film at night uh, after practice and, and study those cans of film. And they were, uh, you know, uh, those old tick, 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 tick uh, projectors that go back and forth. Uh, you know, it was a big help. Uh, and then they, you know, then they went to, uh, you know, videotape and then obviously everything is now digital. So, but back in the day, it was uh, literally a projector and, and cans of film. Was that always like a, a very, maybe not therapeutic, but um, some, sometime you enjoyed alone? Because I know with some people, like if they do like film work or production, let's say they enjoy being in the editing room and just kind of breaking everything down. I mean, did you like being in that state where you can just really dive deep into a team's tendencies, like a 
almost like um, solving a puzzle in a way. Well, yeah, that's a good analogy because you are trying to solve a puzzle and and uh, it's important that you do or you might get killed. So, <laughs> you know, that's your motivation. But as far as, you know, being alone with with that uh, can of film and that projector, um, time is, is uh, stand still because you have no, uh, you know, nobody telling you the meeting's over or, or whatever. So you can spend as much time as you possibly want. Yeah, certainly. Do you remember the first touchdown pass you ever threw as a Charger? I do. Do you remember who it was? Jerry Levias. There you go, against the Steelers in 1973. That's right. It was a, yeah, the funny thing about it was is it was a, a double delay route. Uh, I think we were in the red zone. And Pettis Norman was our tight end. And he broke open uh, right away. And I almost threw him the ball. And then I saw uh, Jerry behind him breaking at the goal line. And that was a better choice because he scored easily. Do you still have that game ball? Uh, I didn't get a game ball. We lost the game <laughs> 38 to 21. Uh, <laughs> was that, I mean, that was kind of like, uh, I mean, the Steelers had made the the playoffs the year before. What, going in, was that a little intimidating for you? Or were you just up to the challenge regardless of who you were going up against? No, no, no. no yeah. <laughs> First of all, United started, and uh, I was on the taxi squad and wasn't activated until the game time. And so uh, the Steelers killed us in the first half. And, they, you know, John had a bad day, and it was you know, his first trip back to Pittsburgh and ages and where he grew up. And 38 uh, nothing was the score at halftime, okay? And I get the nod to go in and... <laughs> And try to win the game in the second half. So no pressure. Uh, we did score twenty one, but uh, it wasn't nearly enough. And so, in your first seven years um, as a pro, you had six different offensive coordinators. Which, for any quarterback that survives that long, let alone under those circumstances, that can really jeopardize any potential they have, or you know, halt any growth. I mean, how were you able to stay true to your foundations as a quarterback, and what made you special while having to assimilate to uh, an offense almost every year? Well, the first three years was pretty chaotic, okay, uh, but the fourth year, a guy named Bill Walsh was our offensive coordinator, and Bill. Broke my game down, tore it apart, and rebuilt it from the from my shoes up. And uh, by that I mean the footwork and and uh, the movement in the pocket. And I studied a lot of tape of uh, Kenny Anderson and Greg Cook of Cincinnati because that's where Bill Walsh came from. Uh, nobody knew him as a genius at that time, but anybody that worked with him or for him as a quarterback knew that they had something special. So that's when. Uh, my game turned around uh, because of the foundation he built. But he left in 1977. So uh, he went to Stanford and had great success there and then on to the 49ers. So um, it was rocky in 77, uh, rocky to start 1978. But after four games in 78, Pro Throw was fired and Don Coriel was hired. And uh, that's the reason you're talking to me today, or it's because of Don Coriel. Yeah, so let's go deeper into Don, because I think it's hard to really understand anything in the moment, or maybe not anything, but I think most things it's difficult to grasp, just the amount of impact that it has. Because you guys really did usher in an entire new way to play football, certainly offensively, but also uh, defensively through that virtue. I mean, were you guys aware that you were really pioneering something different and kind of setting the stage for what the NFL would become? Uh, no, again, you know, we're as ball players, you're thinking about that next game. And uh, Don Coriel had tremendous success at San Diego State, throwing the ball and doing things that were unusual at the time there. Then he went to the St. Louis Cardinals and did the exact same thing with, you know, Jim Hart and Jackie Smith and, and uh, Terry Metcalf and the great players they had in St. Louis uh, with the Cardinals. So, we knew when he came to San Diego that, oh boy, this is going to be really good because we've now finally got a coach that believes in us and believes in throwing the ball. And all of a sudden now we, we draft uh, John Jefferson. The next year we draft Kellen Winslow. We already had Charlie Joyner. Uh, we had a great offensive line. We traded for Ed White to be our right guard. So uh, a lot of things fell into place then. 
but uh, Coriel made it all happen for all of us. Yeah, I mean, it really is unbelievable, even by, I mean, I, I guess, you know, for in the NFL today, sometimes people find it hard to believe that there was such a thing as football before fantasy or social media. But I mean, when you watch any of those games that you were playing f- from 78 all the way up until you retired after the 87 season, I mean, I think the offense, with the exception maybe of dropping back on a center, is as modern as ever. I mean, what you're doing with Kellen Winslow and the amount of shifts and formations, it's just incredible how timeless it is. Well, the thing that, that, um, uh... Coriel could always spot is a player who had the ability to do more than one thing, uh, to play more than one position, and and ask players uh, to do more than one thing, and see if they can do it. So, and he also was great at asking for input from the players. Uh, can you do this? Can you? What do you think about that? And so, the important thing for a player is when a coach gives you the opportunity to contribute uh, an idea or a play, that player is going to make that play work because now he has ownership of that play. And so he's going to play better. He's going to prepare better. And, uh, you know, that's, that was one of the beautiful things about, uh, you know, the Eric Coriel offense is that we all had input and we did things that we knew we could do. And, and he believed in us. Yeah, I think sometimes that works to everyone, everyone's benefit whenever you can drop an ego and kind of do things by committee, you know, some things obviously you need to take charge in. But I think when you're able to kind of get people's input to figure out how to utilize everyone's strength, that's, I think that's oftentimes when you find a recipe for success. I think you're absolutely right, Aaron. And, and, uh, you know, that's why Coriel was the first coach to win over 100 games in college and over 100 games in the NFL. Now, obviously, being that this is the NFL, you can't do something for very long before teams begin to um, catch up with you. So I'm curious, what did you guys, how did you see defenses begin to adjust to catch up to your offense? And how did the Eric Coriel offense evolve to counteract those defensive adjustments? Well, the first thing was uh, nickel back and dime back and you know, try to take away uh, the passing game and then try to get matchups that would be favorable. But when you've got a guy like Winslow, there is no favorable matchup for a defense unless you double team him. And sometimes that doesn't work because of his, his size and strength and desire. Um, but uh, you know, the Coriel philosophy uh, was that we're on offense. Okay, the word defense means defend. Let's make them defend the entire field, the entire length of the field, the entire width of the field, and, and put guys in those positions to stretch the defense every chance we get. So every pass play, we had a guy, uh, one guy, depending on, you know, the formation and the route that was going to be going deep. And that was our first look deep first back towards the line of scrimmage. And so, you know, that pressure, if we were on the two yard line coming out with our, you know, feet in the end zone, uh, we're going to throw the bomb to open up the defense, make them think. The worst thing they want to do is give up a 98-yard touchdown. So let's make them think about playing a little bit looser and we can get out of this hole. Well, I think it's interesting, too, how anybody could go deep. I mean, one of my favorite games of all time, and to me it's one of the best games, is actually a regular season game in 85 when the Raiders came to Jack Murphy Stadium and you guys pulled out, I think you had lost to them on Monday Night Football a couple of weeks before, and you pulled out like this power eye formation with Buford McGee. I think Lionel James was next to him, and then in the backfield was Gary Anderson. And you would yep. hand off to Buford, and then he would pitch it out to Anderson if there was someone coming at him. Um, but that game to me was like a perfect example of like the ingenuity. I mean, here it is an offense that obviously can throw the ball so well, but to incorporate some of those kind of plays just showed – the versatility I think of Corey on the offense and what was especially crazy was seeing guys like Lionel James that would line up in the backfield and then he would just sprint downfield 30 or 40 yards and catch a jump ball it was incredible you know the, the thing about Coriel is that he would find out if a guy played quarterback at some time in his career and so Buford McGee in high school was a high school quarterback oh really Lionel, Lionel James in high school uh, was a quarterback, and Pete, Pete Hollihan, 
uh, was a quarterback. In fact, Pete Hollihan went to Notre Dame and competed with Joe Montana and obviously lost out, and they moved him to wide receiver. So uh, Pete Hollihan threw a couple of touchdown passes for us in his career with the Chargers. But that option play, obviously, Buford had run that a thousand times in high school, and Lionel James had done the same thing. Whenever they, whenever you first installed that off, uh, you know that player, that offense. Uh, obviously, you didn't run it every play, but it seems that season you guys used it pretty frequently. I mean, were you kind of skeptical about you using an option play in the pros at that point, or were you guys willing to just really try anything? Well, as long as it wasn't me running the option, I was <laughs> fine with it. <laughs> Let them take the hit. No, uh, it just the creativity and the the pressure put on the defenses was. Uh, you know, they are scratching their heads. I mean, in that game, uh, we were, you know, Lionel could play in the backfield or out wide. And we come up with line of scrimmage, and there's nobody covering Lionel James. And uh, we had a secret call, 0-0. Zero, zero. Everybody stops. I throw the ball out to Lionel, and he goes 30 yards for a touchdown. Yeah, and then uh, in overtime, he closes it off with a walk-off touchdown. Yeah, yeah. That was a good one. Did you uh did you call your own plays? Nope. Not nope. at any I point. Had, uh, no, not really. You know, I was always given the opportunity uh, if I wanted to change things and do do something I wanted to do. That was always built in. But you know, when you've got a, a obviously Don Coriel and a Joe Gibbs was our offense coordinator for a while, and then Ernie Zampezi. Uh, you know, these guys are, are. And the other part of it was, is that because we're changing personnel almost every down. Uh, to get personnel in the game when you're calling the plays yourself uh, is very difficult, obviously. And did you begin to see at any point in your career that teams were starting to adopt a lot of the same philosophies that you were doing on offense? Did it become a point where you kind of felt like now you had suddenly realized how much, uh, how impactful this offense was? Well, you know, um, I I remember playing in a uh, Pro Bowl and Steve Largen was one of our receivers. And uh, we used to like to throw the, uh, the post route on time instead of way down the field. And uh, it basically it becomes a longer slant route, which is about a six-yard route. Uh, the, the post route on time out, right out, the, out of the break is about 15 yards. So uh, Steve and I worked on that in, in the Pro Bowl, and it worked out very good. He liked it a lot. And uh, so we go play Seahawks next year, and he's, he and Dave Craig are killing us with that post route. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah obviously we did influence a few teams now did you have like a, a favorite go-to play that whenever you needed uh either to get an you know something going or like a, a surefire pass that you had in, the, in your back pocket that you always went to you know i i felt that way depending on down and distance and, and where we are on the field uh that any play that they called it, it was going to work because our routes our receivers uh, had to adjust on the run. And so uh, they would read the defense as I'm reading it, and uh, uh, they would make the proper adjustment, and I would throw the ball there. Now, people always ask me, how many times did you audible? And believe it or not, I hardly ever audible. If ever. Uh, because our system was so airtight, we didn't have to change plays. That's interesting because Marshall Falk actually had said the same thing when he was in St. Louis with uh, Mike Martz that they never audible. They always believed that whatever play they called was going to be able to gain yardage or even go for a touchdown. Well, and, and the thing is, you know, Marshall was a great, great player. And I had Chuck Muncie, a great, great player. And and uh, uh, if we ran a running play and it, it didn't get any yards, that's OK. We'll, we'll throw it the next down or something. You know, we're 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 capable. We do. We, we're different, okay? So uh, you got to stop us, and, and we're not going to get hung up on trying to match our play to what you're looking you know, at and, and what, how you're adjusting the defense. So we're, uh, we've got this thing handled. Good luck trying to stop it. Was there like a particular defense that you found challenging throughout your career, like one that it always felt like it was going to be a battle through and through? Well, every game was potentially a battle. There was very few that you walk in and, and uh, walk out feeling like it wasn't. Uh, so, uh, you know, there are physical battles and there are mental battles. Uh, you know, you play the Raiders, you know it's going to be 
very, very physical. And and at times when you played a team like uh, Denver with uh, Joe Collier as their off defensive coordinator, tremendous mind, uh, you know it's going to be a challenge mentally because he was going to give you a lot of different looks. So, uh, you know, each week is a is a unique experience. So most of your teammates would say that your strongest attribute as a player was your leadership. And you were, you're very point blank about saying in the past how you had a lot of expectations of your teammates and yourself. So you were very uh, hard and honest with everyone. And Bill Walsh has actually said that you were the best leader that he ever saw. Was this instinctual for you right when you came into the league? Or was this something that you kind of learned as you took more and more of a presence on the team as you uh, kind of progress in your career? Well, you know, it wasn't something I, I, I think it's just part of, of my makeup. I mean, I, I learned a long time ago that uh, as a quarterback, uh, you don't have to be the best, you know, friend on the team. The most important thing is that you're respected. And, and the way you get respect is through hard work and, and performance and, and uh, you know, practice. Uh, because as you practice, that's the way you're going to play. And so our practices were always very intense. Uh, and if we made a mistake in practice, uh, we would try to fix it immediately. And if we made a mistake that same play twice or three times, uh, you know, we'd throw that play out. Or uh, we'd get another player in there that wouldn't screw it up. You know, it was one of those. It was just so intense and so uh, game-like uh, that, you know, I wanted it to be perfect. And when it comes to the quarterback position, I think that's the position that draws the most comparisons um, in the sport. You know, when Marino came in, there was a lot of comparison between you and him by uh, newspaper writers. Coriel at one point had compared you to Bob Waterfield. But I'm curious, from your vantage point, has there been a quarterback since you retired whose playing style has reminded you of your own? Uh no, I you know I don't I don't even think about something like that. I mean, uh, it's a compliment to be compared to to Marino and Bob Waterfield. I know that, uh, that that's awesome because uh, you know, you have a lot of respect for both those guys. But as far as looking at a guy and say, "Oh boy, he looks just like me," well, <laughs> I, I feel bad for anybody that looks just like me. <laughs> <laughs> Now, but having played in both the 70s and the 80s, are you more partial to one decade um, as opposed to the other, just in terms of the talent and the way the game was played? No, it, uh, you know, um, the 70s for me weren't that great. The 80s were a little bit better. So, uh, <laughs> you know, that we had a we had, we had a lot of success and, and uh, had some colossal failures, but that's kind of the way the game is. Uh, not everybody wins the Super Bowl every year. The last question uh, for the Chargers I have is about Gene Klein, actually. And I just want to know, was he as much of a wise guy, personally, as he portrayed himself to be to the public? Well, he, he made his uh, gazillions as a used car dealer, so you tell me. Well, I read his book about a year ago, too. So for me, it was it was funny reading. He put a story in there about when he had to go testify to Roselle in, after that 73 season. and he runs into Howard Cosell and Cosell asks if he could borrow his uh, or ride with him on his private jet to Palm Springs. And he tells Howard, sorry, Howard, we'd love to have you, but it's a small plane. And I don't know if we have enough oxygen to sustain you. <laughs> <laughs> That's a pretty good line. Yeah. He, good. He, he just seems like such a humorous guy to me. So I, I'm curious, obviously there must be a different relationship seeing as he's the owner, but I was just kind of curious if he was as sarcastic or brazen as he was personally. Well, not negotiating a contract. He wasn't a whole lot of fun. <laughs> it was tough. You know, my first contract was a uh, $15,000 bonus. Uh, and my regular salary, I was holding out for twenty five grand. They wanted to give me twenty one grand a year. Uh, so I settled on twenty three. So uh, he was tough. Now, after your playing career, you became a broadcaster. Uh, was this always a foregone conclusion that you wanted to do this after you retired, or did it come on at, at a certain point? Well, you know, I was uh, raised by a broadcaster and, uh, you know, a very good one in San Francisco and my dad. So uh, there were times when he would let me keep stats for him in the press box at Keysar Stadium. So uh, watching him work and 
uh, knowing uh, what a tremendous uh, occupation it was, I just wanted to give it a try. And I was lucky enough that CBS uh, in 1988 gave me a, a tryout and uh, gave me a, a shot at it. What is the tryout process like? Do you typically sit down with the person they project you to be the partner with of an old game? Like, how, how does that process work? Well, for me, that's what we did. Is they had me sit in a studio with Dick Stockton, and uh, we called the game off the television. And uh, you know, Dick was my partner for the first two years, and then uh, I worked with Vern Lundquist uh, for four years after that. And CBS lost the uh, the NFL contract, so. Uh, it was uh, short and sweet, but uh, it uh, worked out very nicely. Did you seek any advice from your father whenever you first got the job? Oh, yeah, I wore him out. <laughs> <laughs> How do you do this? <laughs> no, he, he was uh, uh, a great uh, fan and a great critic because uh, when he said something, you knew what he was saying was the right thing. He was big on, on uh, grammar and. Uh, uh, usage and uh, uh, not uh, using the same uh, adjectives time after time after time. Uh, he said, use your brain a little bit, kid. I think it's interesting, too, that coming because he was a play-by-play -play guy, and I believe you were a color commentator when you first started, correct? That's correct. Yeah, I feel like it's kind of interesting to kind of hear uh, his perspective on what makes some of the guys that he worked with great and how, how you could probably – or how you might be able to incorporate that. Yeah, I mean, back in his day, uh, having a color commentator is a little bit different because they really didn't have replay as much as, as uh, they do now. I mean, they're they're replaying every play from six or seven different angles. Uh, but back in the black and white television days, uh, you were lucky to get uh, the, the split receiver running a um, you know down and out route. What is the toughest learning curve for someone who's played football and transitions into broadcasting, either in the booth or in a studio? I mean, do you, do you find that a lot of players have similar experiences going into, you know, these professions that have a, a sort of hurdle to overcome? I, I think the thing that, that um, for me, and I can't really speak for anybody else because I haven't really talked to anybody about that, but uh, is, is the criticism part of it. And, you know, that's tough because, uh, you don't like to be criticized as a player, uh, obviously, um, but I always couch my criticism as to what that player is going to hear tomorrow from the coaches. Because I've been in enough of those meetings. Uh, I've been criticized enough by coaches. Uh, so I know what they're going to say. So uh, I try to think about that when I'm talking about why a receiver uh, dropped the ball or ran the wrong route or cut his route short or, you know, a running back missed the blitz or a linebacker, you know, whatever. So uh, that was always in the back of my mind. And as someone who's called both NFL and college games, number one, I mean, do you prefer calling one to the other? And is there a difference at all in calling a college game versus a pro game? Well, the hotels are better in the NFL, so that's <laughs> that's the one thing. Uh, um, you know, the college game is uh, a challenge because there's so many players uh, and so many double numbers, okay? Um, but uh, the unpredictability of the college game makes it a lot of fun. And the fact that these are 18, 19, 20-year-old kids playing, uh, anything can happen. Uh, so that, that makes it uh unique uh the nfl you have continuity in the nfl you know the players uh the biggest thing in the off season is to find out which free agent went where uh but you know him anyway you know what his, his background is and his college and all that stuff so uh but with college you've got to learn you know a lot of players in a big hurry uh but it's fun uh the atmosphere in a college game uh the nfl tries to duplicate it They'll never be able to because it's just, uh, you know, 100,000 seat stadium uh, and just the energy is just uh, sometimes just off the charts. What was the loudest college stadium you've ever been to? Wow, that's a good question. Um, I'd have to uh, I'd really have to rack my brain. I, 
you know, the, the one stadium I loved more than any was obviously the Rose Bowl and working Rose Bowl games with uh, Keith Jackson. Uh, just, uh, just a tremendous uh, experience getting to work with Keith and, and getting to know him and, and uh, travel around our country and up and down the West Coast with him and all the people that uh, respected him and loved him and uh, just uh, a wonderful experience. Did uh, you ever? Did he ever give you any advice at any point? I I don't know how long you were commentating games for that point, but was there anything that you learned from him from a guy who has just been doing it his seemingly his entire life? He always told me to keep my notes close. <laughs> yeah, you know because uh, you know there are times when you forget what you're going to say, and if you got your notes there, uh, you might be able to find the right word. But uh, the thing about Keith is that. You know, when I first started working with him, I worked with him about four or five years. The first game, uh, I'm listening to this voice and the words that are coming out of this beautiful voice. And about three plays go by and we go to commercial. And he, in commercial, he says to me, well, Bouncy, are you going to talk today? Or are you just going to stand there? <laughs> And I had to apologize and say, I'm sorry, Keith, I was just enjoying your broadcast. Yeah, you became a fan again. <laughs> Obviously. Now, you kind of alluded to this earlier about um, color commentating being different, and you were referring to the 50s, obviously, but I'm curious, since you came into the business, have you noticed a shift in the profession of a color commentator, and have you like noticed any evolution since you first came into the booth? Um, I think that each each guy has his own style, which is good. Uh, but there are some cookie cutters out there that uh, are trying to do it by the book. Um, obviously, you've got some players that or some analysts that want to predict every play, and and uh, which is a, a dicey thing to do because if you're not right, um, you know people are going to jump on you. But I think the biggest uh, thing now is social media and how. Uh, everybody is, is an instant critic and, and uh, uh, without really knowing what's going on. And that's that's uh, unfair and it's not uh, right, but uh, it is the way it is. And, and uh, you know, that Twitter thing can get uh, get guys, uh, you know, fired sometimes. There are some people I know who are do like acting or something like that. And sometimes they won't even get auditions if they don't even have a certain amount of followers. So, I mean, it really does play a big part in a company's decision-making nowadays. Yeah, yeah, it's unfortunate. Um, you would think that uh, your talent would get you what you need, but uh, it doesn't always work that way. Yeah, that, that's that's for sure. I was kind of curious, too, because, I mean, sometimes when I watch a game, you know, from back in the day, like whether I'm watching, you know, you know listening to someone like Kurt Gowdy or any of the guys from the old school, it kind of seems like there's a little more stoicism in their delivery and, you know, Monday Night Football could be an exception with Howard Cosell, but yeah, it just seems like I think there's a lot more of that personality factor in an analyst role today. And I was curious to see if that was something that was that you had noticed from being on the inside. Yeah, I think that that's uh, that's good. I think that's why guys get hired It's because they they've had experience as a player and they have a personality and it comes across and and it's enjoyable to listen to. Was it uh, an adjustment for you doing Monday Night Football when you had three people in the booth? Well, the third person was a tough one, and I love Dennis Miller, but uh, my goodness, uh, what's that got to do with football, Dennis? But uh, that was that was uh, the way it was, and that uh, unfortunately didn't last very long. But uh, it was a great experience, believe me. Uh, that that's the best show uh, on TV at the time, and uh, I was real lucky to get the to get the part, and uh, I'll never forget uh, some great times, especially in the back of the limos because we never had limos anywhere else I was at. Was that the only time you actually ever worked in a, like in a three man booth? No, I did it a couple of times at CBS with Dick Enberg and Randy Cross. And that was, that was fun because Dick is so great. And, and Randy is such much, he's such a fun guy and, and knows so much. So uh, that was, that was pretty good. I like that. So the last question I have is uh, throughout your career, you were, a very humble guy in terms of, you know, sharing credit with your teammates and, you know, kind of staying out of the limelight. Um, you know, I think you said something to the effect of, you know, when you throw a touchdown, the credit goes to 11 different people. And when you throw an interception, it's your fault. 
But if there was a personal achievement in your career or a contribution you made to the game that you're most proud of, what would it be? Oh, I just think me being part of the uh, the Air Coriel offense and the way it's um, been carried on and influenced the way the game is played today. And for someone like you, Aaron, that said nice things about, uh, you know, maybe changing the game because of the things we did, um, obviously that's going to make me feel good. Um, as far as a individual accomplishment, uh, being voted to the Pro Football Hall of Fame is, is as good as it gets. You know, I wish I had a couple of Super Bowl rings, but uh, we tried and we gave it our all. And, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm proud of that. Yeah, you, you have certainly left your mark. There's no, no denying that. All right, Dan. Well, this was an awesome time speaking with you. I really am glad and honored that you took the time to come on the show. And like I said, whenever I reached out to you before, I mean, you played well before my time, but I've had the chance to watch a lot of your games, and I, I really do enjoy watching you and the Eric Coriel offense, giving me a lot of uh, a lot of entertainment and a lot to think about. So I am really am grateful that you took the time today. Well, I, I appreciate your preparation, and uh, this was a, a fun deal, Eric. Take care, man. You too.